We're still the only consulting company ever to have done that. Um, however, I was a bit tired of the oil price crashing, and at my early baptism in the oil industry was I just found out I was going to be a farmer. Went offshore, where we were drilling the first horizontal well in the world, riserless, and um, found that myself engulfed in the Bagra Alpha disaster. So I spent the worst night of my life as 167 people lost theirs. It still makes the, arm, the hairs on my arms stand up every time. And I made it a plan that I would never let this happen on my watch. So when we were a drilling project management company, up to 600 people working under our management, I wanted to be sure that everybody was safe and that everybody was doing what they should be doing. It set in train several events for me, so we developed a four-dimensional appraisal system for competency, we ended up going worldwide with BP, Shell, BG, Premier Oil, Neptune, Energy, etc. And when the oil price crashed yet again, I found the drilling project management company shut down, virtually nothing to do, but the software was still functioning, we were still making decent money on it. So I walked away from an incredibly good business, shut it down, transferred the money from that into a software company. This is, this is quite interesting actually. A friend of mine from university set up a drilling project management company at that time and sold it for £26 million. So that's possibly a bit of an error on my part. Um, so anyway, stuck with the software since then, got wrapped up in the Deepwater Horizon disaster, this time because um, investors were coming to me as an ex-BP guy saying, what's the probability of BP Halliburton and Transocean being found grossly negligent? Had that happened, it would have taken down 20% of UK and USA territories. It was so colossal. And uh, I did some work. I can't tell you what the findings were, but I was right. Uh, and um, we were asked by our clients, who said, look, you've got this competency stuff, yet this disaster still happened. So can you take best practice off the servers off the bookshelves, place it in the hands of people as they do their work, so that we know within the organisation and its supply chain what's happening 24-7. And that's what we're doing now. So we've taken that system, our ambition is to diversify into other sectors. We've achieved that in a remarkable sense, in as much as during COVID, um, PepsiCo came to us and they said, look, we've got 45% absenteeism in our workforce in the UK. What can you do to help us onboard new recruits quicker than we've ever done before? So we got them down from 10 weeks to 2 weeks, an 80% improvement in efficiency. They've ended up taking the system worldwide. So we've gone from HPHT oil wells into Doritos, Monster Munch, you know, Quavers and um, Quaker Oats, etc. And it's now multilingual, online, offline, and in any language. So we've got it in Mandarin or the European languages. We are currently involved in the Grenfell disaster because having been involved in two disasters, I can't get involved in another one. Um, this time because in my lifetime as an entrepreneur, I bought five new houses as I moved around the country. Two of them were highly explosive. And when I investigated, I didn't see any semblance of competency or compliance throughout the food chain from the architect's first initiation of an idea to hand over to me as a property owner. I referred to um, Dane Hackett, uh, my thoughts on this, and I would like to think, I'm not sure this is true, is a thing called the Golden Thread that we're going to be filming a podcast on on Monday, which is the demonstration of competence and compliance throughout the organisation and its supply chain is now a legal requirement in the UK. And it's a breakthrough for any industry, I think. So that's where we're going. Where are we going as a company? We are currently sitting on about tenfold growth from current clients' capabilities. And we're diversifying into other sectors. So we're currently in oil and gas, wind, food and drink. We've been invited into insurance in the Middle East as a partner with Willis from London. And we are looking to break into the finance area. So that's where we're headed. Perfect. Thank you very much, Peter. And finally, Kevin, um, a little bit about why you founded the company, what it, what's doing, where you're going next, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Paul. I'm the MD at Solab in Aberdeen, which I set up in 1991, 32 years ago. Uh, the reason I set it up was I went on holiday, I came back, and the company I was working for had gone bust. And so I uh, approached a couple of friends and said, would you back me? Um, and uh, they did, they gave me a little bit of seed funding, and I traded it out of that. 18 months later, I bought them out, and that was over 30 years ago. Um, about 
15 years ago, 20 years ago, we brought on a development team, software development, because we kept getting asked by oil service companies about all of these files we've got for confidence and certification and big mag boards of where are my people and I can't, I don't know where anyone is, I don't know if they're home, I don't know where they are. And we kept seeing this recurring theme and we wrote a few systems and then eventually we, we wrote a both. And that became a product line called Onboard Tracker, which we then spun out uh, nine years into a company. We built it into a SaaS. And uh, what I thought was going to be a system that tracked 30 guys and an operations manager is now used globally by sub C7 uh, Bill Finger. We track about 15,000 people for. We've got Technique, Stena, Harbor Energy, Apache. It's just gone nuts. We, we employ almost 40 of a team based out of Aberdeen and we're looking to double that in the next two years. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, panel. We'll come back to you just in a second. So what we've got there is ambition. You know, we've, the, the team here have got through necessity. One of them's come back to no job uh, from holiday. The others have come back to, I don't like working for, for that corporate entity. It's not moving fast enough. But all of them had a great idea to move that forward and created a, you know, a scalable, ongoing and ambitious businesses off the back of that. The, the theme of uh, this morning and, and the panels we were speaking to them uh, was about the use of data and accelerating um, yeah, ESG adoption uh, as we move toward net zero. Uh, and I'd like to use this next section of, of, of you, if it's okay with everybody. If it's not, we're still going to do it anyway. So we're going to use the next section to get examples from each of the, the, the companies on the panel about how their use of data, what they're, how they're using data, helps their customers with that adoption of ESG as we move toward net zero in that, in that environment. And Adrian, maybe if I could ask you to go first, would that be okay, please? Um, really, it was something that when we spoke about this panel session coming together, it was something that all of the panel felt quite strongly about. They've got good examples, and I hope they haven't forgotten about them. But we're looking for one good example from each of you as we work along the line about how we can use that there, please. Thank you. Okay, so um, to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with the one that's uh, more human based. Um, a lot of people see ESG as uh, reducing carbon footprint, and it is. And you create that by doing a lot with machinery. But from a people side, if you can make them more efficient, make them work efficiently, it's, it's the same effect. Uh, so, so we used one solution that, that we decided to roll out uh, where it was wiping out a small forest every day uh, with the safety behavioral based observation program. Um, and we used the digital tech to move away from CAD and paper based solutions to a solution that's now used across the globe, across so many facilities, uh, using iPads, using uh, entry points in any language. So we're using the technology to pick up the language, allow people to work more effective, effectively, make those observations in their native tongue. Uh, the end result is the safety of these installations has made one last step change, probably the last step change before the robots really do take over. Um, in doing so, these facilities are not shutting down. They're not having to lose X amount of days or weeks or flying out helicopters. And all of this does add up to ESG goals, targets, and objectives. If you can keep these assets, the facilities, and people working at their absolute peak, that's the best saving that you can get. Uh, so that's the, that's the example that I'm going to share. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it is making a difference. So that's a great example. I mean, you're, you're, by using data, really well and evidencing it and making it in the hands of everybody as they're working with everybody's safer and you're moving toward that net zero you're helping your customers in that space in real time that's it the the assets are staying up the assets are not going down because of nasty events and uh, less impact with investigation teams sorry <laughs> but uh, yeah that, 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 that's you know everyone says the biggest prize out there yeah. is making savings and that's that's the example i'm showing Thank you, Adrian. Steve, we'll just work our way along the panel, so just yep. do the relay over the mic before the show. Yes, we grow. Um, so when, when I think of ESG and how, how data plays in that space, really, if you're going to do ESG, you're going to have to create targets. So you're going to have to say, I'm going to reduce my CO2 by this, I'm going to be more efficient by that. Um, and you need to know when you've met them, and you need to have measurable goals to, to lead to that. 
Um, from my perspective, or my company's perspective, where we play in there is by making it possible to use the real data from real equipment that already has sensors to see if you're meeting those goals. Um, and if not, to explain why and what you need to improve. So um, if you look at like a manufacturer, a food food manufacturer, most of them don't see anything about what their machines are doing. And most of them, most of the machines are completely separate. So every part of the process, you think about when an ice cream manufacturer, you you would have like mixing the cream, uh, you'd have keeping it in a tank, and then you'd be freezing it and you putting it into pot. Everything's completely separate, completely disconnected, and no one gets a good overview. But if you can get that overview, you can see where all the problems are. So that's where we play, making it possible to bring all those things together and get insights into where the, where the real wins are and what the things can change. Fantastic, thanks very much. Arash. Um, actually, what Steve said resonated a lot with me. I think what, uh, what is not measured cannot, cannot be improved. You have to be able to, to measure these things and evidence the fact that you've progressed. I mean, there's, it's a lot of organizations say, you know, we've got these targets, we've achieved these targets, or how have you done it? You need to evidence it. So, so that, that resonated with me quite a lot. I think that's ultimately what we're doing here is using data to evidence uh, progress. Um, the examples I want to give is, uh, is a couple actually. So for the solutions that we still develop for our clients, um, we're working just now with, for example, Peterson Logistics and uh, working on optimizing their, their transport loads with trucks. Um, so there's a lot of inefficiency in these loads when they're taking them from, from Keyside and, and using, using some optimization techniques there and, and then looking at that data, seeing at how many trips can reduce that to and optimize those loads. So that's, that's been an interesting initiative. And, on the, um, on the environmental side, on the incident side, on environmental, we've been ingesting um, historical data using our signals platform, our AI platform, to understand um, where contamination and leakages occur and why they occur. And, and by addressing them with, with really good preventive actions to address not just incidental issues, but, but systemic problems. And um, we're all about systemic problems and solving those things. So, so by taking that data, ingesting it, using natural language processing and, and seeing the volumes of those things, the patterns, the trends in those things, then being able to say, okay, so it's when X, Y, Z scenario happens that this is the occurrence and there's human factors involved in that as well, how can we address that with one fell swoop? And that's, that's what we've been doing. Great example so far. Pete, thank you. Um, <coughs> many thoughts on this subject. In my history, I've been involved in um, quite an interesting project on the south coast of England where um, we ended up developing a, an offshore field from onshore, hiding the rigs. And I was talking to an air hostess once and asked where she lived. And she said, Cool Harbour is at home of the second largest oil field in Europe. She said, No, we don't have any oil there. So it just made my day. My um, point being that there's an awful lot of people that spend 24 7 protecting the environment already. And even though we're producing oil and gas, etc., most of us are environmental. By nature. I'm a rock climber by background, live on the coast, etc., threatened by tidal rises, etc. So we underestimate what's actually going on. We don't capture that data and we don't manage it properly. So even though we're, we're doing quite a good job in some senses already, we've got a great deal more to do. And my view on the current situation is it's the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. And it's the best time in the history of humanity to be a scientist and an engineer. Um, so anything we can do. This is not about politicians, this is about every single one of us. It's the future of humanity that's at stake. So I'm very passionate about it. So my little contribution to this is going back to my well integrity days with oil wells. One of the easy low hanging fruits that are out there is there are many low standard wells internationally that emit raw methane into the atmosphere. It's a major pollutant, it's a major contributor to ozone destruction. If we only took the best practices that we already have and distribute them by role and make sure that they're actually used on site and we can geolocate the person, make sure they're deploying the appropriate actions, make sure that they're closing down those wells and using the right technology, the right techniques, then we can actually reduce that methane right now. And so one of the biggest offenders in this area is North America. And we've been trying to get the North Americans to adopt this. So we'd be able to say, so take, get rid of your paper checklists, get rid of the guys that you're sending out there. You don't know if they're sat in McDonald's on a local bar or actually on site. We can tell you that they're there, that they're gathering the appropriate video evidence that they've done what they're supposed to do and they're dealing with that new thing. So that's just one example, but it's basically taking best practice, making it role-based, making it specific, making it measurable, because 
as, as a couple of guys have said, what gets measured gets done. And my view on the approach to climate change right now is there's an awful lot of talk, an awful lot of ambitious goals being talked about, predominantly by politicians who never do anything other than boost their own ego. What we need is action by real people that's measured and done. Perfect, good summary. Call to action on politics. Well, we'll maybe get to that one, but you'll probably find all part of the politics to the, to the next session. While we move to, to Kevin, if you've got any thoughts, you're getting to know the panel now, what they're doing as a business is and what their points of view are. If you've got any questions, raise your hand and we'll come to you in the, uh, in the next few minutes if you've got one. Thank you. Or two, or three, or four. Kevin. I'd like to ask how many systems it takes to track one oil field worker. And the truth is that the North Sea runs on spreadsheets and everyone thinks that a spreadsheet's low cost but actually when you take the example that I would give we've got clients who previous to putting our systems and bringing all their data into one place didn't have access to the data they needed and we're booking out supply vessels and dive support vessels two weeks ahead of a, a one week job and then keeping them for another two weeks afterwards and you think a rate of £27,000 a day or whatever they were at the point just to hire them. But what does it cost? It costs a, a cubic meter, a cubic ton, sorry, of heavy oil to keep a vessel in position every single day. Just to sit in, and not out in inclement weather, just to sit there and it's sitting for two weeks before a job and two weeks after a job doing nothing. Just because they didn't have access to the right data to get the right people in the right place at the right time with the right competence and the right certification and mix that team and make sure you've got the right place. So that, that's what we we help do that. As an aside, we did a little project last year where we looked at every single site that we take out for every client, where they've got servers, they've got SQL servers, they've got multiple servers, they've got air conditioning. Every site we take out for every client is 2.5 tons, so it's not that much, but it's every single one of them. 2.5 tons of CO2 for every single site and every single client that we've got all in the world. So in a little way, we can do that as well. But the major thing is, that's looking in the stationary cupboard, when actually we want to look at the big things that are costing all, all of this uh, um, uh, environmental issues, uh, just because of poor operational uh, uh, efficiency because they don't have the data. And uh, maybe stick with you, Kevin. And um, are you seeing that link between accelerating to net zero, ESG, and good old fashioned IT consolidation or modernization? No, we don't have the budget for IT, so it's going to impact the other two. We've now got a budget for ESG and net zero, so it's now impacting the whole business. Uh, because we're from very similar backgrounds in that IT infrastructure part. Do you see that becoming much more secular now within organisation decision making? Uh, absolutely. If you look at um, risk, risk sits with risk managers within these bit large companies. Risk managers don't have budget. They get all the money they need exactly when it happens, but maybe not ahead of time. So you might ask all you like for an IT project, you might ask for all of, all of the, you might ask for years, and all of a sudden it happens because something changed. COVID, <laughs> risk management, where did the money come from, come from to replace all that stuff when it wasn't in budgets the year before? Something changed and they made it happen. And ESG is now in every C-suite, every risk manager, every, every office is now measured. I'm trying to get venture capital. You have to, you have, to have your, your ESG ducks in a row. Uh, so it's driving that. Um, and, and, but as we've talked about before, it's not about greenwashing. It's actually living it and making sure that you're delivering something. And, and Pete, maybe back to you on that point and around risk and greenwashing. And we'll, we'll, we'll still part the politics part. But but budgets are being enabled, enabled and in, for investment to next year and an investment in ESG rather than it just being a cost centre uh, in terms of the digital space. Do you see that more and more in your side of things? Uh, actually, we'll pick up on the risk aspect. We've got a big history in risk management. So we've done over 300 projects on risk assessment and management, including twice uh, you having oil on every beach, three corporate collapses, including BP on the Mekondo or Deepwater Horizon disaster. And so we've got a big history of doing very complex Monte Carlo simulation, looking at probability of certain outcomes. 
So recently, what we've done with our software is um, a typical risk process is to assess the risk and group of people like yourselves together. So what are the risks in this project? Then we lay out what the probability of occurrence is, the impact of occurrence is, what are the mitigating actions we're going to take, and what's the reduction in probability of reaction and impact. And we plot these on Boston scales and Tony diagrams. However, in my experience, more than 99% of the time, the mitigating actions are used best practice from either the internal organization or the supply chain. What we're doing is flipping that on its head. And we were interviewed by a couple of senior uh, advisors from Gartner on the subject of risk management, and they said, one of them said, we're going to look back on risk management as if we were driving from the back seat of the car. And the other one said, I view you as a chat GPT of risk. And I said, why? And he said, because you're telling us where the next incident is going to be. And that's, that's the journey we're on. So what we're able to do with PepsiCo in the UK, where we're gathering circa 40,000 data points a month, is we're able to say, you are going to have this kind of incident on this particular production line with this particular shift, most likely led by that person, if you don't use this best practice. And not only that, we can take that best practice and make sure he actually does it and give you the statistics to show that he is actually using that data. So I flipped your question there, Graham, did I? <laughs> no, no I, I think from that point of view, you, what we're talking about is what is the enabler? I mean, yeah, what, what is the enabler for budgets in this space? Is it ESG? Is it net zero? It's not IT anymore. I think we all know it's not IT. Actually, the digital of, mask is now A couple of interesting stats on that, and again from Gartner, is um, thankfully Europe is leading the way on ESG, so circa 53% of the budget on ESG management systems is coming from Europe and we are a leader in the UK in that domain as well. And we are finding that, for instance, there is a particular standard from the USA which is used for ESG reporting, and circa 95% of Fortune 500 companies are deploying it. So there is budget, there is real appetite for it. It's one of the fastest growing areas of tech investment. In fact, the, the latest thinking is that it might be another one of these bubbles where too many companies have been invested in too rapidly. But yes, there is absolute appetite for it. And for very good reasons, we talked earlier. Yeah, biggest threat facing humanity. Let's go, there is budget. Yeah, absolutely. And Arash, when, you, you, when you're looking at projects with customers, I mean, you mentioned Peter so where, where, where how are you identifying to unleash that spend when you're, obviously, you're seeing what the problem is, but what does the customer see what the problem is that you're solving? Well, it's an interesting point because what the what our, our friends here have said is, is, is quite right. We, we've been in pitching uh, solutions and looking for that proactive response from the client and typically you know we'll, we'll be said well you know we're not we're not quite there yet or that's that's a bit overkill for us at this stage and then what happens is a significant event occurs and um, the significant event could be anything from a, a fatality to a significant uh, spillage or leakage to a significant shutdown or equipment failure and then you'll be amazed at how quickly the phone starts ringing. Um, and they, they remember that discussion that we had and the presentation that we had about, about those proactive measures. Um, so the budget seemed to materialize at that point <laughs> and, then, and then they've got the money to spend this stuff. But we would, we would wish that um, that mindset would change and, and, and the proactiveness is there to, to put the best facts in before the significant event occurs. Um, and I think that mindset is changing. I think uh, those that are leaders in this space and, and some of the the, uh, the operators that we work with are, are certainly looking at that way um, and we're working with water waste utilities companies, rail construction and they're all kind of coming towards that. Oil the gas looked upon as, a, as more mature in that sense but others are coming on board as well. And we've now flipped it to the proactive side so as well as doing the investigations on the incidents that have occurred and understand the root cause of those, we've put in place uh, solutions where they can do audits and, 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 find, and findings that they have in those audits, ta tagging them with the same taxonomy so it says, and like everyone else has been saying here, if I'm getting the same finding occurring on these audits time and time again, if I don't address this, that's going to result in an incident with the same, the same group cause. And that's, that's, that's where our focus has been. But the budgets are found when, when the bad stuff happens. It's just we need to get it a bit, a bit earlier. Always the case. Let's, let's invest in airbags after the crash. Steve, how, how, how do you feel about what's been said so far? I completely agree with everything that's been said so far. I think what I would pass the mic on then, that's for now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> 
But I think all of that is, um, I've been going through kind of a, a, a journey of thinking that's very, very close to this. And, and the frustration with people that don't realise that an event may happen, that realise that when it does happen, is something that really rings with me. Um, it, I mean, it's great when a client has a problem, they phone you up and you go, if there's a fire, I need it taught, right? You, you go in, you're the hero, you put the fire out, you get paid, job done, everybody wins. Um, but, I, but like Raj, I, I often think about how do we change this around? How do we get people to think positively about the future and actually catch it before it happens? Because, oh, we didn't have an accident last month, doesn't sound nearly as exciting as, oh, we, we had something and we've managed to solve it. Um, so I've spent a lot of time actually making spreadsheets um, that, are, that are calculating this to say, right, this is the risk of this happening. So if this happens when it should, um, then this is how much it's costing you per year. So here's how we can change that. I put it in the client's language. I think this is something we, we should all do more of because uh, they don't seem to be able to do it themselves. Um, and the more that we can help in that way, the more they're likely to buy what we're selling. But that education part, just as you need to pick up the microphone, Adrian. I mean, we're, uh, my other business, my business, the thing that keeps the shirt on my back is uh, a big part of what we do is cyber security. And it's still not taken seriously until there's an event. You know, it's, it's like anything, health and safety, all these other things. Health and safety is a lot more mature in the North Sea for lots of reasons. But when there's an issue, there's also a, a magic budget appears from somewhere uh, through necessity. We've all, we've all seen that. It's just the next generation. So Adrian, you, you mentioned robots earlier, and someone in the panel mentioned AI. It wouldn't be a conference for tech or digital if it didn't mention the robots or AI. But we'll talk about budgets, and then I'll, I'll maybe come to you again on the question about robots and AI. How do you feel about what's been said in the panel through? How do we, how do we educate our customers about the problems that they probably don't think they have until they come and slap them in the face? Well, it, it's, it's certainly present. I mean, what you said is, is when a horrible event happens, people very quickly realize that technology is part of the solution. And once that realization is, is in place, it starts to trickle to the other functions. You know, many of our solutions have been built on the back of a horrible event, like these guys, I'm sure. But the good news is most, the, and the higher up you go, many organizations know that technology is part of the future. If you're not with it, you're gonna get left behind very quickly. So those budget and the discussions are starting to talk around adoption of new technology. I think since 2020 and OpenAI has, has you know, really come to the, to the forefront, people know it's going to accelerate. And it's going to accelerate at a pace that we can't imagine. It would just stand to see it trickle into the workplace and change the way we work. Uh, I suspect most of us have seen a 20% productivity increase in the last year through adoption of new tech. And that, that, that mindset and that realization is going to trickle out into the mainstream. And that will unlock a lot of budgets and the folks that are not with it will get left behind. And, and you flippantly, but I think it was quite serious when you said earlier, this is probably the, the last generation of tech innovation that the robots are not at the front of. And, and, and not, in a, not in a Terminator type way, but robots being pieces of software as well as hardware. This is probably the next 30 years. You know, this is the 50th offshore Europe. So the, the fi offshore Europe in 50 years' time. You know, I won't ask that question to the panel. Although it'd be a great one to get your thoughts on. This next generation of tech that's now filtered in is going to be way more impactful than probably the last 50 years in a much shorter period of time. How do you see that impacting customers and your own business? So there's, there's a really good phrase that I like to use, which is uh, AI will not will will not be stealing anyone's jobs but those that know how to use it will. And that's this generation. They're, they're going to learn how to leverage AI. They're going to learn how to embed it into every part of the organization, which is good news because what Pete said about this huge challenge in front of us is real. And unless we get super smart about the way that we run our businesses now, then that challenge is going to be a real hard challenge to, to me. And yes, it will eliminate jobs, but it will create a heck of a lot more, and it will open up the minds to new ways of working and new creativity, which is what we're going to need to fix the problems that we're facing right now. It's a great point, and I'm just as working way along uh, with the same question for Steve. Adrian, do you think there's a lot of user apathy with AI right now in terms of it's a lazy person's tool? Wow, well, um, I think it's not a still answer in your part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you well, finish each other's sentences quite on? And we'll get back to the ecosystem in, in a second. Yeah, but yeah. Carry on. Um, I mean, I think it's kind of interesting now because I've used ChatGPT a lot in my work and I feel guilty when I do it. 
So I think it's actually the other way around. The people aren't eating it enough. Um, and, and it's not the apathy, it's that they feel like they shouldn't be, and that it's cheating. Uh, so I, I'm encouraging people to use it. I think it's a great thing. Um, and I think it's only going to improve productivity for everyone. I mean, when you look at the waste, I mean, we're all talking about waste, that's something we can prevent in many different forms. Um, so the amount of waste that I can take out can absolutely. I'm glad one of you got the mental word there. But I mean, that, but <laughs> we're, we're, and, and, and Ash, if, from, from your point of view, as we, as we move along there, that digital robotics and AI, we have, we are comfortable with it, but I think we're all still at that tip of the iceberg because our customers are not whole half of the adopting it. How do you see it impacting your customers and then obviously your business in terms of? So on the business side, I agree with Steve. I think um, we need to harness the power in the right way. The phrase I like to use is, you can you can use this effective if you know what good looks like. So if you don't know what good looks like, um, and the outputs you're getting from, from AI, etc., and you're just adopting those things as verbatim, then you run a massive risk, because you're, you're, you're putting something into a solution or whatever that you haven't fully understood. But if you know what good looks like, and you know what your, what your target is, you can use that type of technology to get to that endpoint faster, quicker, and more efficiently. So that's how, that's how I like to see us leveraging it uh, in our business and for example our developers to optimize their, their code quality or code delivery etc. So we should be able to cut that time down. I've been in meetings with other CTOs in OpenAI conferences where there are some worrying stats coming out where they were going to recruit say 100 developers that year now that's becoming like 10 or 20. I think we need to, across all businesses, not just um, developers, uh, lawyers, accountants, etc. They just adapt to this technology. They need to adapt how they work to, to leverage the best of it. Um, and then, then we don't see it so much as a threat. And it's like, you know, you could be an accountant doing your, 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 your books with the paper and pen and now you're using a calculator. This is the same evolution. It's just an evolution of technology and we need to just, can't just do the same old things again. We have to adapt to, to using it properly. And the customers will be the same. Good tech used well accelerates change. Great, great way of looking at it. Pete? It's a, an interesting question for me because the, the whole idea of how quickly we can change an organization has been the bane of my life, actually, because we like to think we move quickly, but actually evidence will show we move remarkably slowly, particularly when we're dealing with large organizations. When we're trying to embed our technology in some of the world's largest companies, believe me, it moves very, very slowly. And so take, for example, Samsung, who have recently announced that there will be no AI in their organization. You have to start asking yourself why. And the reason is because they don't want their IP, their intellectual property, um, being captured by artificial intelligence and shared with their competitors. A very, very good reason for slowing down. So looking at where we set the boundaries for the capture of that data and how we protect our clients such that they feel safe in our environment falls very heavily on cyber security but also on subjects like blockchain and the ability to se segregate data between clients and give them true protection because the threat to them is absolutely ginormous. It could take their company down in a heartbeat. Imagine Ap Apple's tech being in the hands of Huawei or whoever their competitors might be. You could take a circa three, now $2.8 billion market cap company down. So, you know, the, the threat is also there. So that's why companies tend to move slowly. And we have to pay attention to that and be understanding of that. Because it's one thing to say, we as tech people can solve every problem you can possibly think of, but we have to bear in mind the governance of the clients that we're dealing with who can be rightly protected. Have a think about uh, any questions you've got from the floor. Stick your hand in there. We'll, we'll come to you if you've got any. Kevin? I'll come back to what I said earlier. If, if your data's all over the place and sitting in spreadsheets, you're not even at data 1.0, never mind AI. People need to get to 1.0, get some reporting, get their data together, get to data 2.0, start to get some proper reporting and analytics, then data 3.0, they can start to leverage that and have AI doing it. Right now, they've got it. The data's all over the place. It's still in cabinets. Yeah, AI can't get in that cabinet on a rig. <laughs> yeah, so digitization, I mean, we've known it for a long time, and 
there's still a lot of that stale information. And when, 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 it, when the data can't be moved and accessed, it's stale, so therefore it's dangerous, in, in my mind. It comes through because it can impact the business. So we're in our final 10 minutes because we need to wrap up now. And we're part of the SDI stand. We're part of one here. That's an ecosystem in Scotland. We talked about blockchain. And I think I saw Sipper's name kicking around there. They're on one of the stands here and they're, they're heavily into blockchain. But I'd like to talk about the ecosystem here in Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. Five companies based here in Aberdeen want to grow from Aberdeen and internationalise and are internationalising from Aberdeen and maybe work our way along. How has the ecosystem that One and Digital Tech has created that you're part of, how has it helped you and will help you moving forward? Because I think it's really important in terms of the ecosystem if you've got a contribution. Would you, would you, find, would you be sitting here if it wasn't for One? And how has it helped you going to move forward, if, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, thank you. I think the, the impact that one has had is, is immeasurable on the, on the digital community up here. Um, my father was a baker and he it was a part of an association of bakers and they, although they compete with one another, they would bake for one another when the other went on holiday. But you look at the IT industry, everyone's website said we do exactly the same and we all compete with one another when actually we don't and there's more than enough out there for all of us. And then creating an ecosystem where you get to know one another, you understand what people do, and, and you get to know one another at a personal level, and then you understand that the same problems that you're having are, and this are, are with the same types of clients and the same types of things, then we can all, all help solve that together. Thank you. Uh, bizarrely, in the year 2000, Aberdeen Council set sail for Nova Scotia for Software 2000. I went there, that's where the people from the Titanic are very interesting. And um, I thought, brilliant, Aberdeen's finally caught up, we're on this uh, journey of time. Um, and that was pretty much shut down for a period. And so for me it's delightful to see that actually we're realising this is a major growth opportunity. Other areas of the world have picked up on this and have grown enormously, and Aberdeen can do that, and necessarily must. So for me, if we could back this group of tech companies and put it under one umbrella and forge alliances that made us actually work as well, just imagine as a biotech. So just having the ability to talk to one another, leverage each other's thoughts and ideas in a place that we all feel safe in uh, is great. And I think looking at a number of younger people here, you're the entrepreneurs of the future. Listen to what's been said here. We were once your age, and we once thought we could do it ourselves, and we are doing it ourselves. And that's another great thing that I think um, places like One Techno give you the opportunity, give you the platform, give you the flexibility, and the encouragement, and you can and should do it. So, in terms of One, I think. Um, uh, one is facilitate a platform where the technology companies in Northeast Scotland could really showcase themselves. I think we all knew the capability was there, but one's kind of shone the light on it. And, and, and be really helpful in terms of, I've been part of the business growth program uh, with individuals on this panel, and that's been really good. We've had graduate funded programs and got really good graduates into the organization uh, through one. Um, we've had funding for our, for our projects. So it's, been, it's, been a great, uh, it's been a great experience for us personally. And I've always been an advocate of of our capabilities in Northeast Scotland. I think that the companies here have not only the technology capability, but we have the domain knowledge fundamentally to solve these problems. I think if you take this type of work down to the Central Belt or, or further down South East Central, they don't have that domain knowledge and experience. They live and breathe these industries. They understand it in context. And that's why what makes us effective. And, and me and Steve have collaborated on, on, on projects for performing clients. So that collaboration is, is happening. We understand each, 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 each one's strengths and we, we leverage those to, to maximize our capabilities. It's great to hear that we've got an industry that this, this, this show and this event is all about that the rest of the UK and probably a lot of Europe is jealous of, envious of, because it is such, it's such a huge industry to help us springboard forward from. Um, you know, there's not just these guys, there's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of examples. Steve? Yeah, I mean, um, so pre-1, I would say that if you look around Aberdeen, you find a lot of people fighting each other for different things and not realising the numbers. Um, I think I was once in a panel with you and it was eating somebody else's lunch, was the, was the term that was used. Um, but, but you can feel the change happening. 
Um, you know, there, there's a real theme in the area around tech that's growing and it's growing and it's growing. When, when you look here, you, you've got a of a few people, but this, this spreads a lot further. Um, there's an example of a, a robotics company, it's going to put robots into manufacturing, that's part of the, the one ecosystem. When you put that together with a bunch of the things that everyone does, these are all things I find. It's not one of them, it's all of them. And it's how we put that together to make it really easy. Because if we bring them together, we're effectively a massive vendor that is the area, and we're able to compete with some really big guys. Um, I think one's created the, the catalyst to make that possible. And, and you can see it in, in, the, um, in the programs that we had us on. Because you need to meet people to be able to break down the barriers to see that actually they're not, they're not looking to eat my lunch. They're, you know, we're doing different things. Great. Adrian. Yeah. Uh, so, pre war, well, I would steal that. Uh, we were probably about eight in the space of a few years, we've grown to 20. Uh, it has, it acts as this incubator. Uh, it hasn't changed much of the client base, much of our stuff is overseas still, but it gave us the confidence and the connections and the advice and the, the, the networking that allows us to take that next step and to grow. Uh, Aberdeen has been an oil field capital of Europe for a long, long time, and there's no reason it can't transform into a, a capital of innovation for heavy industry. The wind, look behind us, there's a bunch of new industry about to grow at a huge rate, and we're perfectly positioned to, uh, to, to grow with it. So, uh, invaluable. Uh, the one, the ETZ, the SDI, they, it's, it's, it's been phenomenal. I mean, what we what we wanted to do by putting this panel together is uh, represent what's happening in the northeast of Scotland and heading towards those 10 to 20, 30 million pound digital companies. It's that that is a game changer outside oil and gas, but absolutely enabled by energy. Energy sector enables that. And you look at the boards that are kicking around here about uh, alternative in terms of hydrogen and wind farms and so on. That's the next stage of enablement, in, uh, enablement from energy for companies like these to scale and new companies to start as well. Question at the back from the gentleman there. You'll need to be loud if that's okay, sir. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks very much. So my name's Joel Evans and I work with Invest Aberdeen. So we're the Inward Investment Hub. We'll work with the likes of one. So we're looking to bring companies and investment into the region. From your perspective, what does the region need to do to make this happen? And what would be good Inward Investment to come into the region? So you've got the microphone. One thing, we're on a time. I've got to, we've got to be out of the room in four minutes-ish. One thing that you want to tell us to leave the room with for Inward Investment. Go. Copy the Scottish Tourist Board PR because they've done an amazing job of making Scotland and it is a beautiful place. Uh, Aberdeenshire has got so much to offer. The outside world may not know just how much it's got. So uh, make it public. Perfect. Steve? Yeah, and um, in doing so, take a look at what we've got, the things that are hidden gems right now. I mean, we'd be hidden gems if it weren't for this panel that one's created. But, um, Taking these things, putting them together to create the podium that shows the things that are here. Because you, you kind of have to show it's here already for more to come. Never been called a hidden gem before, but carry on. I think uh, investing in the next generation is the big one for me. Um, and, and, and I know Steve does a lot uh, with the university, and, and I've done the past as well. I think the next generation, giving them platforms where they can learn the new skills they need to learn, is, is a huge one for me. Because I think we have got a deficiency there at the moment. So that's, that's important. Great point. I think the, um, the statement that was made my brain there about we have an incredible platform here is staggering. So the reason that PepsiCo picked up our products and took it worldwide is because of our oil and gas history. So, you know, quite as a monster, which how far away from oil and gas can we possibly get? And the reason that we're involved in the Grenfell disaster is because of the work that we've done in oil and gas and trying to prove competency and compliance in an extremely complex world far more complex than the construction of buildings. So the credibility that we have as we migrate into other sectors is absolutely amazing. Thank you. I think we need inward investment, not market political on it, but we, we need inward investment of narrative that keeps us right. If we, if we don't have people here, we've got a brilliant STEM and digital environment up here. And if, if we don't nurture that, keep it, and grow it, we're gonna end up like the shipyards, we're gonna end up like the coal yards, 
and, we're, and it's, it will happen really, really quickly. So anything that, that enhances that and, and keeps STEM in this area is what we want. I think that's a fantastic conclusion to a really entertaining panel session this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, could you put your hands together and thank Adrian, Pete, Kevin and Steve. What I will also say is all five of them don't do this, but they're all arriving at the stand. So if you want to call them, they're all in the stand, which is just the other side of there.